What this is, is a community discussion. And we have people who are core devs. Um, we have cat herders here. Um, we have all kinds of people who are from different organizations who bring different skills to this. And what we're going to talk about is Ethereum 1x. Um, and so this is an open format. This is a fishbowl format. And so what that means is people from the audience can join us. And we, we have these two, this chair right here and this chair right there, we're going to try to keep open. So if you come to the front and there's someone there, you can kick them out if you would like to, to join. Um, but I expect this to fill in more as more and more people want to participate. If you want to keep participating, you can move into one of these chairs and just stay. Uh, maybe you won't get kicked out. But I think anyone could be kicked out, so sorry. Um, but yeah, just keep in mind, you're, you're free to participate. So we're going to have, um, I guess we'll try to keep a mic, mic over here if anyone wants to come. And we'll put a mic right here. Um, and so I guess we'll get started. The key, the key to this is we're, we're going to start with what, what does the community want to talk about? What do developers want to talk about? What do core developers want to talk about? Um, and then I'll, I can just pass the microphone on to you all. And then maybe you guys can get started with the conversation. Um, Sounds great. Should okay. we do intros with some of the people up here who are core devs and stuff, just so people are familiar? Okay. Well, everyone in the circle gets an intro. So oh, perfect. Yes. If you're going to sit in the circle, then uh, introduce yourself, please. Yes. Yeah. OK. So let's kick it off. I'm Jamie Pitts. Um, I work with magicians. Um, I also work at the Ethereum Foundation. Um, that's Annette back there. Um, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah. OK. Hi, guys. I'm Annette, and I'm working with Ethereum magicians. And I'm helping out with operations and organizing events and making sure that all those people and all those di important discussions will happen. Cool. So we'll leave it to you, Hudson. You want to introduce, okay. oh, introduce so, yourself? Alexia. So um, my name is Alexia Hunov. I'm, uh, I've been working on TurboGeth client, which is derivative of Go Ethereum. And also the last this year, I've also been involved into research and development of uh, into state rent and stateless clients, so which I'm all these things I'm still doing. Um. Hey, I'm Hudson Jameson. Uh, I work with the Ethereum Foundation and with the Ethereum Cat Herders. I uh, also um, am one of the organizers of the bi weekly core developer meetings along with a few other people who uh, we all help out. Uh, I'm not a core dev, uh, but I try to keep up with the tech so that I can facilitate the meetings accurately. Uh, I've been doing that for the past three years, roughly, um, so I know a lot about the process, uh, EIPs, the hard fork decisions, things like that. So that's how I feel like I will contribute today. I also have a talk tomorrow on the main stage right after Vitalik. I think it's at 10 uh, on ETH1X. So if you want to see a more formal presentation that I have slides for and stuff, feel free to come to that tomorrow. That's the end of my shilling. Hey, uh, I'm Tim Bako. I work uh, with the Pegasus team on the Hyperledger, Hyperledger Basin client. Uh, I'm a product manager, not a core dev, but I do attend the calls to try to wrap my head around the process and, and the EAPs. Uh, and I'm also part of the Cat Herders. I'm Rai, also at Pegasus, working on Hyperledger Besu. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Martin Svende, and I work for the Ethereum Foundation with uh, security issues, uh, Ethereum infrastructure, mainnet. And also, I'm one of the coders uh, on Go Ethereum. Hey, so I'm Peter, and I'm currently the lead dev of Go Ethereum. That's about it. Who's this guy? Just some guy. Oh, I'm, I'm Vitalik. I advised a couple ICO projects that you did Bitcoin Magazine before. <laughs> Hello. Uh, technically, I'm not a part of the core team. But I'm, since I'm sitting here, I'm doing the uh, notes and the clients with the nation state cryptography for the uh, Russian Central Bank. Hey guys, uh, my name is Cody Bourne. Um, I'm a developer on the Azure blockchain team uh, at Microsoft. Hi, I'm Lucas. I'm just a random software developer who worked on DApps, and I'm a bit humbled sitting in this magic round here. OK, so what do you guys want to talk about? Um, what do you all want to talk about? 
if, if there's anybody who has a topic that relates to Ethereum 1x, uh, please come forward with it. Um, is, do we have something? OK, come on down. Come on down. I also have a topic. OK, so you first. I'm worried Sorry, about the uh, uh, scalability <laughs> of Ethereum 1. So um, we can't even reprice opcodes um, without breaking anything. I mean, we had this discussion with the 1283, I think it was, uh, the problem. And now we have the same problem again with the 1884. So as a developer, I would be really interested in seeing some invariants uh, that I can work with so that my code that I write and deploy on the Ethereum mainnet doesn't break in the future. And I mean, in the, in the case of the 1283, uh, the developers weren't uh, following best practices. But now in this uh, 1884 case, uh, yeah, uh, people wrote code. They followed every guideline th that was there. And now uh, the code breaks. So yeah, I can kind of give a quick intro to this before we have some comment from some of the other developers. But we had an EIP. And basically, um, in order to make it the blockchain a bit safer to prevent from, and please correct me because I'm going to butcher this, from uh, like DDoS attacks, uh, we uh, repriced an opcode. And in repricing that opcode, if you have a smart contract that relies on that opcode being a certain price, that contract may break. Uh, there was a bunch of contracts that have upgradability. I believe Aragon was one of them. And those uh, are going to be able to be upgraded, but it's a little bit annoying. There's other contracts that may have the effect of having funds locked in them. That's a little bit scary of a term. So what we did is, in order to prevent this from being another scenario where it's like, we can't get our funds out, things like that, what we determined was, if people come to us after we implement the CIP, and they say something like, hey, this is you know, messing my contract up. We're going to research and come up with a solution, a workaround, so that they can uh, have their contracts work again in those limited amount of cases. Did I get that I'm almost right? OK. Yeah, Martin can also comment a little bit more on that. Um, yeah, and you brought up two cases, 1283 and 1884. And they're kind of different, because 1283 was made to improve the life of DApp developers, making it cheaper. Um, whereas 1884 uh, has been added as a, basically a security precaution because uh, to, to rebalance the opcodes. And the former one, we skipped that so as not to break stuff. Um, it's being implemented now again in the form of EP2200, uh, but with a minor modification so that it won't start uh, introducing new vulnerabilities into contracts. And in general, the idea uh, that has been floating around a lot is that if we do changes to the EVM, we will also do versioning so that uh, these new features will be opt-in. However, it really makes, it's really kind of uh, makes no sense to have opt-in features for security features where we want to protect the base layer. Um, so thus, we're rolling out 1884. And the thing is, this will affect a lot of contracts. But in the large majority of cases, uh, it will only mine, affect them a little bit. Like most use cases that are affected can be solved by adding a bit more gas uh, at the beginning. and. I think that would cover like 95% of all the cases where it's uh, going to be affected. But then there are some particular, particular flows where it's already uh, encoded that it's, a, it's an automated transfer into something else. And that flow between two contracts uh, can thus be broken in a way that is not fixable. Um, I mean, not fixable by the initiator of the, of the transfer or the operation. And so that much has been, you know, we know that this might break things. The question is, how hard will it break? And, and how much pain will it uh, bring? Because I think that in many cases, uh, contracts are actually upgradable. 
And if you have a set of contracts which suffer from this, you can actually redeploy it and fix it that way, which further brings down the number of actual broken flows. And if, there, if it can be evidenced later on that, hey, we have actually these particular instances which are broken, cannot be upgraded, and cannot be salvaged in any way, then we can look at, okay, so what fixes are needed to solve these instances? And there are a couple of uh, ways uh, that may help in most of them. I, I think, in, for example, if we lower the cost of a log operation, uh, that will solve a lot of the issues. Uh, but it remains to be seen exactly what kind of patches will be needed to, for the yeah, to get the maximum coverage of the rescuing, or what do you want to call it? So maybe just a step back, I thought it might be useful to just offer an introduction as to like the specific kind of gas cost increase and some of the security background around it. Um, so it's a kind of general fact in Ethereum. So in Ethereum, we have different kinds of opcodes. We have opcodes that do computation, add, divide, subtract, elliptic curve pairing, and so forth. We have um, and we have data, and we have opcodes that do disk I/O. So basically, opcodes that read from read from contract balances, read from contract state. So read things that require uh, basically accessing the disk. And it's been a general fact of Ethereum pretty much since the beginning that the gas costs that we set for those opcodes are, for multiple reasons, far lower than they should be. Um, so one of those reasons is that. The op, like relative to their gas cost, the opcodes actually take a fairly long time to process because accessing disk is pretty expensive and takes a long time. And so, for example, there was this recent paper that suggest, suggested that like on their own hardware, a worst case DOS block would take like up to 80 seconds to process. And like making a worst case DOS block is hard because you have to outbid like literally all the other users. But there's like it's. Security is still lower than we would want it to be, especially given people's, people's desire for more scalability in the medium term. And so from a security point of view, it's like pretty much required to increase the gas costs of checking contract balances, reading contract code, doing, like reading contract storage. Um, my own personal opinion is that the IPs that we have don't go nearly far enough. But the problem is that the, like, this requires increasing some gas costs, and this basically breaks some contracts that re relied, relied on the assumption that there is a fixed amount of gas within which they could do some things. Um, so I, I think I've written this opinion somewhere, but uh, from my point of view, the the reason why the increases of the gas co ghost breaking things is because the gas is used in two different functions. So first function of the gas is uh, what Vitalik was talking about is to uh, basically measure the, the, uh, the impact on the system, the performance impact and charge people for who send transaction to compensate for that and discourage the uh, abuse of the system. But there's a second function, which also gas, uh, uh, gas uh, plays, which is the restriction of the things like recursion and uh, callbacks. And that, uh, that second function has uh, been on the rise since 2016, when the, the, um, especially after the reentrancy, uh, the reentrancy problems have been kind of brought into light, and people were trying to use the second function of gas much more. To, uh, so they would allocate a very limited amount of gas for a lot of operations to make sure that the recursion doesn't go deep or the callbacks can't do uh, things. But we now see that these two functions are becoming at odds with each other. Uh, while you know improving one, we actually hurt in the other. And from my point of view, the, it, it is becoming worrying because that that tells me that in the future, where well, we need to do more of those things, imp uh, adjusting the gas cost, and we have to assume that we, we we should be doing it all the time anyway, because the hardware changes, everything changes. Uh, we we have to the, the way out of it is to split those two functions and then decouple them from each other, and that does bring complexity because we essentially will have two gases now, 
two gas counters, one for the one, first function, one for the second function, and then you need to decide what is the gas limit, and is it the gas limit for the first one, or is it the gas limit for the second one? But I think it's solvable, uh, and more importantly, if you decouple this, then you're kind of a bit more future-proof. So coming back to your original question, uh, which was about like invariance as a DAP developer, like obviously we need to change the gas cost sometimes because security and a whole bunch of reasons, uh, and some of which we don't know today. Um, so I, I guess it's a question for people up here. Are there like actual invariants that you can give to DAP developers building on Ethereum, or is the sort of hard answer, you know, things will change, they will break, and we'll try our best, you know, to make that the least inconvenient as possible. But it's kind of unrealistic if you're building a DAP to assume, you know, there's any invariance. I think the truth is like somewhere in between, but I'm curious what, what people think about that. Yeah, I, I, I think that DAP developers should have the mindset that things may change. There are no invariants, and they should build their systems or deployments in ways that they can be upgraded uh, because it's still developing. The EVM is still developing. That's my point of view. Just add to that. Um, I think, uh, for, for example, another important thing that dev developers should always keep uh, keep in front of them is that every time you, you find a neat little trick that, hey, I can store this data in a in a more optimal way, or sorry, in a, in a way that kind of is a bit cheaper than storing it the, the other way around. Our goal as maintainers of Ethereum is to make sure that everything is priced correctly, which kind of means that storing data should cost the actual resource. So if you figure out a cheaper way to store it, then there is a high chance that if it, if it picks up steam, then it will get patched simply because it's out of. It's not balanced correctly. So our goal is always to to balance the res the the opcodes to the resources actually being used. And yes, sometimes that means making it, them cheaper, and sometimes it means making them more expensive. But all the loopholes will eventually be filled. So I think that's a good invariant. Um, can I ask a question unrelated? Can we move on from? Yeah, we'll okay. move on to another topic. Go for it. Great. Um, hi, I'm Mariano from Maker. And I'd like to discuss uh, programmatic proof of work. Because I feel like there's a big divide between the background. core devs and community in general. And um, like I've seen a lot of uh, prominent members of different projects and dApps uh, that feel strongly against it, and many core devs that feel strongly for it. And, the other way around. And I don't think we've ever been closer to a potential hard fork since 2016. So I would like to see what you think about it. I think ProgPow um, is really important as an issue that we need to decide. <clears throat> not important in itself necessarily. I am not taking a position. But um, I'll say that because of the politics around it, it, it makes it really challenging. Because on one side, you have um, you know, the people like ASIC manufacturers and users and some investors and stuff like that who say, we don't need it, the threat isn't big enough, or, uh, you know, the people who made it are unknown and that's scary and things like that. Um, and then on the other side, you have the GPU miners and the mining pool saying, we need this, otherwise we're going to go under and you're, you're uh, going against the promise that you made in the white paper, according to them, that... Uh, that there would not be ASIC resistance within Ethereum. So, and then there's many, many other um, arguments. I'm actually, post DevCon, going to make a large blog post, Reddit post, et cetera, with everybody's arguments and counter arguments, so the community can get a better idea of where everybody stands on that from each side. Um, that's on my to-do list, and I, it's nearing the front of it. So uh, that'll happen hopefully before November. Uh, and other than that, I do want to kind of hear the perspective of some of the core devs because there, you're right, there are core devs who are supporting ProgPow uh, from their perspective, whether it's technical, political, or both. And that's another divide that's very, um, that's very naturally occurring is you have this technical perspective where we had two audits done, a hardware and a software audit, that basically cleared ProgPow as something that wasn't super fishy. And then you have... Um, 
And then you, so you have the technical perspective of it's good, we've implemented it, it'll take two to four weeks for the other clients to implement it, we're good to go. And then you have the political one where it's like, um, you know, I hate Christy, Christy's bad, uh, Christy lied, all this other stuff uh, with Core Scientific and uh, the people who are anonymously developing it. So long story short, uh, a lot of politics involved. There's technical versus non-technical arguments, and there is a division that needs to be uh, figured out in a rough consensus style way. Yeah, I am um, personally. I kind of cooled down quite a lot on this particular issue for the last uh, few months. I did see a lot of um, you know discussions, a lot of people. Uh, getting, I hope they're getting more informed about this. Uh, so, and I really welcome the audits that happened. I re read through the audit report. Yeah, I mean, I I sort of had my opinions. I put them out there, and I, I'm happy that you know people were listening and uh, there was discussion going on. And at the mo at this moment, I'm you know I'll be okay if it gets implemented, uh, rolled out, and I'm going to be okay if it doesn't. Uh, so I'm not really going to worry about this. Uh, so if I'm basically if something that I said before, if I turned out to be wrong, that that's fine. You know, uh, we'll, uh, yeah, just uh, kind of moved on. So, so I think it's made a good progress uh, recently. Yeah, so I'm one of the core developers who are pro ProgPow, and I've written down my reasons why I believe ProgPow uh, is the right way forward. Uh, the way I see it, I think there's a very loud, what I perceive as a very loud minority who uh, is extremely loud and spreading a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt about it. Uh, and in my view, there has been signaling taken from the community. Uh, there's been coin votes, there's been mining votes, and et cetera, et cetera. So I feel it has been kind of, um, uh, there has been shown to have uh, great support in the community. Um, and I don't think the situation has changed from six months ago. Um, except that at this point in time, there has been a lot more, um, yeah, a mo lot more churn from the political side and the, and the FUD side. Yeah, and I, from the political side, I would say that one area that myself, uh, that I fault myself on and others is there wasn't enough communication. People like to be heard. And this kind of got sprung on people, some people, because, you know, who's going to read a transcript of the most boring core dev meetings every other week? <laughs> um, I mean, it's not boring to everybody, but like there's a lot of, you know, just very deep technical topics, and the average person isn't going to, you know, realize that. So ProgPow got sprung on a lot of people, and that was a communication error. And so because of that, now people are upset because they felt like they're not being heard now, they weren't being heard then when they felt like they didn't like ProgPow and they thought it was dead because it wasn't getting implemented as quickly. Because this has been on the radar for how many, since last, De no, before last DevCon, so since March of 2018, uh, ProgPow has been starting to be implemented, talked about, et cetera. So it's been a long time. Uh, so I think if we can have people be heard, that's going to, heal a lot of the wounds and start to get us more toward a rough consensus. And I welcome people from the audience. If you have an opinion on this, you can go sit in this chair and like, uh, you know, give your opinion or whatnot. Um, and otherwise, anyone else, we can go to another topic. Uh, one thing that I'd like to point out is... Um, Intro. My name is Dan O'Farron. I'm picking my son up from school. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I've noticed within the past six to eight months with this is there's been a notable drop in civility in the arguments relating to ProgPow. Mm -hmm. And the problem with this drop in civility is people start closing their ears. And there are principled people with real solid objections to it who get lumped together with some of these people spouting these crazy things. And that's doing a disservice to the dialogue, to be uncivil and to be rude and to be crude to everyone and to send all sorts of weird veiled threats to people. That's just not cool. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I want to want to echo Dano's statement. Um, I'm Adrian Sutton. Uh, I work on Beisu. Um I think one of the things that's very dangerous in this for the whole Ethereum community is that if we set a precedent where you can shoot down something by um, attacking someone proposing it personally, then we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. So I'm really keen to hear technical concerns. Um, and that, that includes some politics of, do we actually want to be ASIC friendly? Is, is that, that direction we want to go? Those arguments I'm, I'm all for and I really want to hear. But when we start diving into this person was associated with that, or they're corrupt, or they're and not actually being able to point to this is what they're trying to do. So if you've got a problem with prog power and you think it's all a great scam, then great, let's hear exactly what the scam is, not just a vague thing where we're, we're slandering personalities, because that leads to more and more attacking people, um, which makes it incredibly difficult for uh, people to stand up and make proposals and be involved in the community. We've lost people in the community who are doing great work because they've been attacked personally in the past. We don't want to see that happening in the future. Uh, just to add my two cents to this whole proc power versus ETH discussion, um, I think one of the... Um, so currently my feeling is that the whole discussion boils around uh, ASIC, whether we want to be ASIC resistant or not. And I think this is something that kind of just is tearing the whole community apart. And I, from my personal perspective, I don't really see what's the whole point of, of it. So currently, we have a few big mining pools. Now, if we have an ASIC-friendly mi mining algorithm, then probably we will have some manufacturers that make a killing out of it and some mining pools. Now, if we have an ASIC-resistant uh, mining algorithm, probably there will be some different mining pools and different hardware vendors making a killing out of it. But essentially, from my perspective, currently we're just trying to decide who we want to give our money to for mining or for creating that hardware. Now, if, on the other hand, we can actually technically say that one of them is dangerous, or one of them, or we can somehow prove that, yes, ETHash is a security issue, and we can prove that publicly, then all of a sudden, probably the entire community would shift towards the other one. So if, as long, so if there's a threat to the network, I think then the whole discussion is decided. And if there's no threat to the network, then it's, it's kind of just a heated political thing of who gets to make more money out of it. And that's not going too far, too fast. Right, do we have a next topic or somebody wants to discuss something? Yeah, come on up. You can come on up before we're done talking about the next topic, by the way, and just grab a mic so we know the next one's ready. All right. Hey, I'm Hernando. Um, what's the deal with state rent? Where are we at with that? It's canceled. No, <laughs> <laughs> no actually, it's more, uh, the, the question is, is, the answer is more uh, complicated than that. So our current effort is to prototype and specify. So that's my main effort, my effort and uh, my little team. team. So to prototype and specify the the first viable version of the state status clients, um, what's this? Oh, yeah. Uh, and, um, so, so you, maybe the the, the 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 good thing to put out there is a data data from the status client prototype. Um, if that would be the post to. Mm, my misspelling. Yeah, that that one. That's probably the like the closest one you can. If you scroll down to the there, um, it describes a slightly the idea of that. Da, 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 go down a little bit. It's very old post, but it's still relevant, and it describes what we kind of want to do. And the uh, yeah, further down to the graph, to the the next one. Uh, breakdown. Yeah, a further one. A uh, bit further. Further. Uh, okay, that one. Um, so, yeah, so th th this is the, um, I've done some more uh, analysis on this. But basically, the, uh, what we're trying to do is that uh, we kind of try to circumvent rent a bit. Because as I said in April in our meeting in Berlin, after researching research rent for a bit, for a few months, I've realized that it is possible to do it technically. But it will be a very expensive project to roll out uh, 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 
practically. And the reason why it would be very expensive to roll out right now is the, um, is the cost of ecosystem research, which is, had to be done. Uh, because the, the state rent, wherever, however you implement it, it will change the programming paradigm in the way that, at least in the way I thought about it. Because other proposals where you have a, a kind of attenuated cost of the storage, which I don't call storage rent, it's a state rent, because it doesn't actually remove things from the storage. So, um, so any, any proposals in any shape or form which will start removing things from the state at a certain, uh, after the state rent is not paid, will uh, inevitably change the programming paradigm, and some of the things will become uh, quite kind of unexpected. For example, I'll give you an example now. We have a smart contract in Solidity, and it has a, a variable, field variable in it, and you initialize it in constructor, and that variable essentially, like let's say, pointer to another contract. You initialize it in contract, and it's a non-null, it, it, it reference to another contract, and you can happily use it within the contract anytime. And you assume that it will never go to, it will never disappear. So you don't have to check in every function of the contract that that pointer is still valid, that the contract that you point you know, is still there, because you assume that, okay, yeah, I've initialized in contract, it will not go away. It's like in a kind of const, uh, const variable in C++, right? It will be there. It, once you've initialized it, it never changes. But then uh, with the state rent, you might see that this thing can just go under, you know, it will go under the pointer. So the, 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 the contract will disappear, and then your pointer will, uh, will point to something that doesn't exist anymore. So that sort of, lots of these things have to be changed in terms of the paradigm. Um, so, and obviously there will be some contracts that will be uh, suspect, susceptible to uh, some griffin attacks that need to be, needed to be researched as well. And obviously, uh, the you know, number, amount of resources that I thought would be required for that, to, if we really wanted to roll it out, would be you know, something that I cannot afford, or maybe I'm not sure if Ethereum Foundation would be able to afford that or something like that. So that's why uh, uh, we started to do uh, more emphasis on stateless clients, which might actually, if implemented correctly, and if, uh, if my um, sort of intuition is correct, it might actually give us enough runway um, before we... And then I've got another proposal, but which I haven't published yet, uh, that actually introduces state rent after the stateless client, but in a slightly different and more surprising way. But I don't think I have time to explain Could you it. Is there a way to... I mean, he wants to know the big status, right? So they're basically it's postponed yeah. at the moment until we do the stateless clients. Okay, so... Um, Stateless clients are the way to go until E2.0. That's what's going to hold us over. Uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. because I don't know. Because the uh, obviously the future is hard to predict. This is our current. Uh, I mean, Vitalik so, wants to say something. Yeah. So, an like another reason why it's good to go this way is because the like the e by far the easiest way to kind of uh, merge ETH1 into Ethereum 2.0 is to basically like tur turn it into a stateless client by default because that's just the way that state inside I mean, inside of ETH2 works. So it actually kind of makes the the roadmaps like fit together very smoothly. So the downside of the stateless client related to the state rent is that there will have to be the nodes and network that still hold the entire state, but the uh, this requirement will not will not be um, for every basically full node. So there will be still somebody has to have a, or the entire state. But we hope that this is you know as, as long as not everybody needs to do that, it will be better. So one kind of hard thing about stateless clients that I think it's important to be very transparent and clear about is that make the making stateless clients work well ultimately will require the basically the same kinds of uh, kind of gas cost sacrifices that we talked um, that we talked about in the first question, but probably to an uh, to an even greater scale, right? So for example. The witness uh, size, so the size of like, extra Merkle data that you would need to pass for, to uh, verify a worst case block right now is about 330 megabytes. 
And that's basically because you have contract calling, that's 700 gas, 24,000 gas for a contract, and then add 4,000 bytes for a witness, 28,000 multiply by 1,400, and like you got, your, you got your hundreds of megabytes right there. So, and then there's kind of smaller versions of this attack with things like the balance opcode, S, S load, and all of those things. So I think we will ultimately need to have changes that say like one, the gas cost for these storage accessing opcodes um, op go up more. Um, two is that the gas cost for accessing contracts that have a large storage like what needs to go up even further right so for example charge one gas per byte of per byte of code that you read and if we want to make this nicer one thing we could do for example is we could waive the extra fee if the contract was accessed say within the last 10,000 blocks and that would reflect the kind of the actual load of kind of quote almost stateless clients to keep state around for a little bit of time so like those kinds of like that kind of rebalancing would need to be thought um, thought about as well. So basically, kind of for multiple reasons, like developers should expect that kind of I/O is likely to uh, like storage reading, account reading, cross contract calling is likely to get more expensive relative to other things. Uh, just to pause this topic for a second, I wanted to introduce someone who just got here, uh, Felix. Felix, take the mic and just give a quick introduction. He works on some of the networking Hello. stack. Yeah, I, I'm Felix. I, I work on Geth on on the networking. Uh, I just got here from another. I, I missed the beginning, so I don't really know <laughs> what you guys talked about. But here, it's mostly been about stateless clients, which is actually which add also huge challenges on the on the networking side. So I feel like the stateless clients is basically just as unsolved as like any other problem. Like there has been progress, but it's not really something that I, we can honestly say like is easy to pull off. Like, yeah, I would, I would use the same analogies for quantum computers. I've heard uh, like two, uh, as I've heard about two years ago that in terms of quantum computers, uh, all, the, uh, all the fundamental challenges have been solved. Now it's a matter of engineering to, to build one. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, there is no real kind of super complex stuff in stateless clients that the idea is super simple. You can, yes, there will be more, you know, shuffling data around the network. There will be some issues with that. But I don't see them as being fundamental. Um, uh, can I interrupt? <laughs> yeah. So I, I think there are really fundamental issues there. So the problem is that the moment, so currently transactions are really tiny. The moment you start entering into territories of megabytes, and we're not talking about hundreds of megabytes, just megabytes, the whole networking layer needs to be gutted out and re retrofitted so you can, you can chunk up uh, messages into smaller pieces. That's a lot of engineering effort, <laughs> maybe so, not research effort. Uh, However, so f yeah. just, uh, let me just finish. Uh, however, even if that is solved and the network data shuffling is solved, then if you, so all of a sudden you also need to store these witnesses beside the transaction. So you, you implode or explode, sorry, the, the data usage of the immutable side of the chain. And we can say that, yeah, but that's cheap to store. We can put it on an HDD, sure, but we're already at 100 gigabytes or 150 gigs of tiny transactions. Now imagine that all of a sudden every transaction will be twice or not twice, 10 times the size and maybe instead of 150 gigs, we would have two terabytes of immutable chain. An archive node, all right, basically is the information you need to give a stateless client full syncing data. Yes, he said that again. I'm just saying, like that basic, like an archive node basically is the node, the, the, the node type that has like all of the data with the ability to produce it on demand for any transaction. Yeah, but my essentially without an archive node, you would not. So you either need the archive node or you need the chain of witnesses. So um, one thing we can agree on with stateless clients is that basically it it. It changes the user experience a lot, where previously uh, handling the state was kind of Ethereum's problem. With stateless clients, it's a user problem. No, 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 that's not true. Because uh, I think you might be confusing it with the, what I call stateless contracts. Uh -huh. um, so, they're, they're, so stateless contracts is the, the, the idea. It's actually the, um, it's a design pattern. Uh, where, whereby you start, uh, you, instead of storing your data inside the contract storage, you store some sort of Merkle root, and then you start passing the, 
the like you pretend that there the data is somewhere off chain. Well, you don't pretend that there is off chain, but whenever you do something with the data, you start providing the Merkle proofs, and these proofs are actually inside the transaction, and that increases the size of transaction and so on. The stateless client actually remove. It's not like that. It moves the the burden into the actual layer it, in the protocol layer. It's it's not the the job of the smart contract developer will not change and the user will have the exactly the same experience apart from paying more for the state access. So as Vitalik mentioned, uh, the call opcodes will be more expensive because you have to load the code. The uh, S-store, S-loads and S-stores will be more expensive. Balance reading will be more expensive. Anything that touches the state will be more expensive to pay for the witnesses. Transaction format will not change. Uh, essentially, in, uh, uh, there will be more that data shuffling around the network, but not as transactions, as the, as the uh, basically uh, par witnesses. And of course, the witnesses, we will um, chop them up in parts, so you don't have to, res like, to ensure the, the better propagation. So that is also uh, a kind of pretty solvable problem. Um, but yeah, it's not... Uh, okay. Well, so in that case, that, that, that's like, it's, it's like halfway solution, basically. Like, you do still want to have state. It's not like stateless, as in, you know, like Ethereum itself doesn't have any state. It's more about... So uh, I would say this is the, the stateless client is basically approach of, of uh, instead of asking every, uh, all the DAP developers to follow design, certain design pattern, you just basically solve it for them in a generic way. So if you have a stateless client, instead of telling everybody to, pull, to put Merkle root in the contract, you just tell them, just do whatever you did before, and we're just going to take care of that. You're just going to pay for it a bit more. But the whole technicalities will be taken care of. So we, ha we have the working group session scheduled for later this afternoon and about like 15 minutes left for this session. Uh, so maybe it makes sense to just like have a stateless client discussion this afternoon, because I know there's a whole bunch of new people sitting there. That what time is it? 3.30. 3.30 okay. to the end of the day. I don't know what that is. They have this room here to just discuss working groups. Jason Carver also join. Uh, give a quick intro with Felix's mic. Uh, hi, uh, Jason Carver, working on the Trinity client. Uh, it's an all Python client. I came here to talk about stateless clients, so I guess I'll save that for later. <laughs> I mean, we can talk about stateless clients, but uh, yeah, yeah. Does anyone have anything else? They, oh. Come on up and kick that guy down. <laughs> well, there's still three chairs, no? Oh, yeah, yeah. The mics don't reach that far. Oh, okay. Hello, hello. Could you talk about EIP-1559, which is the idea of um, having the gas price set at the protocol level and it's burned instead of given to miners? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the basic kind of description of the proposal, right, is that we uh, basically add a yeah, kind of negative components to the block reward. So that basically says that like, we have some in-protocol fee and it's an in like, you, within the context of any particular block, you can think of it as a constant, but the constant adjusts up and down over time. And basically, the miner of a block has to pay some amount, or alternatively, the block reward is reduced by that amount, which is pro equal to that fee multiplied by the number of GUE of gas used. And this, obviously, if this kind of, like, whatever this burned fee is, like, it'll push up the minimum GUE for, or the minimum gas price that the miner is willing to accept by roughly the same amount, right? So, like, if the fee goes up to 10 GUE, then the miner is not going to accept transactions that are less than 10 GUE because they're not even going to be not profitable anymore. And the idea would be that we would say increase the gas limit limit of a block from say 10 million to maybe 20 million or more, but then we would have this fee be adjusted according to an automatic algorithm that basically it targets uh, the uh, the use average usage of a gas in a block to be to be at the 10 million level. So if a block, sometimes blocks will be bigger, sometimes blocks will be smaller. Whenever blocks are bigger, the fee goes up. Whenever blocks are smaller, the fee goes down. And so at equilibrium, like there's some kind of ma ma uh, mandatory fee that gets uh, that kind of gets burned, and miners aren't willing to accept below it. But the and like blocks are on, on average going to be like half full or one third full instead of being completely full. The reason why we want to do this, and there's actually a few different reasons. One of them is that well, the most fundamental one is that currently fee markets work really horribly. Uh, so 
One example of this is that like on average, people tend to overpay by a factor of somewhere between three and three and five or higher than five for transactions. And like you see people talking about a trade-off of like you either pay five times more and you get included right now, or you pay like two like the minimum and you wait maybe a minute and maybe ten minutes. But like in reality, that waiting is like completely socially unproductive, right? Because it's the same load to the chain, well, no matter if it happens now or if it happens ten minutes from now. And 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 also just like it adds a lot of wallet complexity that people have to like think about, oh, is this gonna be a slow transaction? Is this gonna be a fast transaction? So EIP-1559 fixes it by making the calculation to a miner much, sim much simpler. The calculation basically is, if there is a transaction that pays the burn, like whatever the burn fee is, plus whatever amount kind of overcomes the extra risk that my block will be an uncle, and that value has been estimated to be about one GUE, then I'll accept it. And so clients would just like pay, like calculate the fee that they pay based on a simple formula and it'll reliably get into the chain. And so users will be able to get like pretty reliable next block inclusion of any of their transactions, even if there are like short term spikes and there's like suddenly two times more usage this minute and like two times less usage the next minute. So it's uh, intended as a kind of fee market simplification and a user experience increase because like users just won't ha won't have to wait anymore. What does that do for um, users who are willing to let a transaction happen sometime over the next day? They they're very price sensitive, say. Yeah, so users will be able to still like basically say, I want to pay a transaction, I'm going to pay a gas price which is lower than the, like, let's say for example, I as a transaction sender see that the current fee that's being burned is like pushed all the way up to 23 GUE because like, I don't know, Fairwind is doing stupid stuff. <laughs> then I as a user know that Fairwind doing stupid stuff is exceptional and four hours from now, chances are Fairwind will stop doing stupid stuff. So I as a user totally can send a transaction with a gas price of say nine GUE instead of 23. And whenever Fairwind stops doing stupid stuff to get the burned gas price, we collaborate down to below nine and the transaction will get included. So that's like totally fine and intended behavior that you can do. So I want to comment on this that we, a lot of times we're thinking about like the one user sending one transaction which is okay, you know, you can wait or you can do it within, like, you pay a bit more. But the real problem is that for the people or for organizations who actually depend on sending tons of transactions all the time, yeah. and for those people it's crucial that the things work well, because they can't just say, well, we're going to close our exchange for four days until this whole things blow over, right? <laughs> or, <laughs> right. <laughs> We still have some time? Other topics? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, any topics? Yeah. I have one actually I want to bring up. Um, br I want to bring up this idea that in order to reduce um, storage requirements on nodes, we like actually uh, make more progress on implementing a mechanism where we only require nodes to store, say, the last year of history, and for anything older than one year, we figure out some way where, no where each individual node only needs to store part of that so that we basically, instead of node storage being 200 gigabytes, it can just be like state plus 10, uh, 10 to 20. When you, when you say splitting it, you don't mean like... I mean should like go to Peter. <laughs> Sounds like sharding, kind of. Is it sharding or chain data frame? Yeah, so I guess this kind of was uh, one of my proposals from way back in, I think, last year, or this year, January, last year, January. So the idea was that uh, currently a lot of the Ethereum's <coughs> chain data, about 150 gigs, give or take, is just immutable past chain. For example, past transactions, past blocks, past receipts. And many people don't really need this. I mean, yes, it's nice that you can dig up your transaction that you did five years ago, but do you realistically want to do it? Now, if you don't want to do it, and okay, that's, that might be an interesting thing for you to want to dig up your transaction from five years ago. I definitely don't want to dig up your transaction from five years ago. So essentially, it's just uh, we're wasting a lot of space for a lot of people, that, and it doesn't really give a, anything 
back. And that, then the, the idea was that can we somehow say that, okay, we're going to maintain the last some time frame, maybe a year, and maintain everything on all full nodes, but everything that's older than one year, let's try to put it, stash it somewhere else and make it available. And generally, I think most of this is doable, so it, uh, it is not even a hard problem to solve. The tricky parts come, um, start to appear with, for example, logs, because the, the so contracts, smart contracts use logs as a cheap data storage, and then they just, the DAP filters for the logs. And the issue is that logs weren't really designed for this, but uh, it wasn't really explicitly said nor limited that this is not the intended use case. The intended use case of logs was to raise events. So the, your smart contract does something, it raises a few events, and then you react to those events. And yes, it's nice that you don't have to react immediately. You can react a day later, a week later, a month later. And that's perfectly fine. The problem is that, for example, there are dApps, kind of like the Akasha social network, which uses logs to store the posts themselves, which means that when you want to list the posts that you've written or your feed, they will actually scan the entire blockchain for data. And these are the use cases that, uh, that get really, really broken because all of a sudden you have a node that wants to access all the time the history going back to the past five years. And this is the, really the challenge that, uh, that needs to be solved. On the upside, however, the nice thing about these uh, chain, past chain data is that it's immutable, which does mean that, I mean immutable. In theory, it's not immutable, but in practice, due to the proof of work, you won't have a reorg that's uh, a million block deep. And this kind of means that you can move this data onto an HDD, so you can actually make, store it relatively cheaply. However, I, do, I still say that if we want to enter this uh, stateless clients territory, then well, if the blocks all of a sudden becomes 100 times larger, then we need to solve this, because even on an HDD, you don't want to put 100 times more data. So it's an interesting problem, definitely. So something interacting with the next section of topics, how does the finality gadget figure in with the chain data? Do we need to keep historical data beyond the horizon of the agreed upon finality? And how far, You know, how important is that? Or a finality gadget, you mean like the ETH2 finality gadget for yeah. this one? Um, and for consensus purposes, you definitely don't need to keep any history older than about eight months. Um, but in like one year was the period that I had suggested we make kind of mandatory to hold. So, oh, sorry. So, so the one proposal and that I that I have for solving this receipt issue is that like it's actually a very nice problem to just solve with a crypto economic light client market, right? Like I want a complete list of all of all transactions that satisfy some particular Bloom filter. I ask you, you give me a complete list, and you sign that list, and if um, it's if someone else disagrees, they can make a Merkle proof and they can like and they can slash your deposit. So, like basic turning, like making something like that. Like, and the the other benefit of that approach is that instead of requiring like you to scan a bunch of headers locally, it's basically a, a few rounds of network messaging. So could be also interesting to look into prototyping in the medium term. So maybe one thing we could do because there's so many people in the room, we just like ask like. A lot of you guys are dev developers. Like, who here needs access to logs from beyond, like, you know, last three months or something? Like, whose devs actually use this stuff? You can just maybe raise your hand if you need access to all the historical stuff. I see about fifteen hands. Yeah. So what about transactions? Whose oh, dApps use wait, transactions? Could we also get some information on why those logs are well, needed? Well, maybe <laughs> later, but like, I mean, Because it's cheaper. <laughs> yeah. But that, that would actually be a really interesting question like, to a lot of client developers. Like, which dApps are like, heavy on like, actually accessing transactions? Like transaction by hash, transaction by block and index. Who, who uses those? Does you. any dApp developer is there and wants to talk about it? Please come over inside this circle because this those mics has a cable, so we just can't bring. So just for the record, I saw two hands for the transactions. Um, three, actually. Oh. Three. Okay. <laughs> well, cool. Okay. So not a lot of people you actually use the facility to like access past transactions is what I'm getting. So well, from this room. From this room, it is not 
Maybe just, not representative, but... Just to expand the reason why Felix was ask, actually asking this question. So we've been sitting on a new feature, for example, in Geth, that... Um, so currently, all full nodes, all Ethereum full nodes maintain an index, a transaction index, that's simply saying that this transaction hash is located in that block. So essentially, it's just a hash to block number mapping. And it seems uh, like a stupid, cheap thing, except when we count that there are 500 million transactions, it turns out that that's 200 gigabytes of data, sorry, 20 gigabytes of data. So essentially, every full node is, is storing 20 gigabytes of data just to be able to say in which block a certain transaction is. And if full nodes don't need it, then we can immediately wipe out 20 gigs of data. That that's, can be reconstructed at any point in time. And that's uh, the reason Felix's question was really, really good, because we always wondered, is anyone actually using it, or can we wipe it? Should it be the default, or should it not be the default? So it's actually really reassuring to see that people don't need it. <laughs> Yeah, come to the mic right there. Hi. Uh, yeah, so uh, I work at uh, Synthetix, and so we obviously have what it's like a DEX, a bit uh, like Uniswap. Excuse me, introduce yourself. Oh, please. hello. My name is Justin Moses, and uh, I'm the CTO at Synthetix. We're a DeFi app, um, and we do indeed need to know the transactions that users have uh, had over time in our dApps. However, we have been using something like the graph, and that's actually been successful. So. We're happy to use decentralized services like that that can track all our transactions um, instead of having to do, like, yeah, you know, at point, go back and look at an individual one. So I guess what I'm hearing is that actually all the people who might actually want access to transactions would totally be fine to, like, externalizing that to some service provider because it is, it's not really something anyone, like, a lot of people expect from the node to, like, do for them to, like, get the transaction. I think Akash would have to, like, rewrite their stuff, but, I mean... No, that's for the I thought they were log heavy. But so if we kind of adopt, like, you get a crypto economic light client implemented, then they could just, like, replace one to two, one to two lines of code, and it okay. would just work as is. And it would probably work even faster than today. But I, I was just follow up question for you uh, on the DeFi thing. When you look up transactions, uh, don't is that ancient transactions, or is it transactions for the last week or month? Uh, no, we'll have all of them. So there were times when we want to go back to look at even you know years worth. Interesting. Um, I wanted to throw this out there real quick. We're about out of time, right? What's it, what, three minutes? Yes. Yeah. So um, I personally think ETH one X, ETH one point is getting stronger. There was a period of kind of like. You know, ETH 2.0 is the, the new stuff, and it's sexier and stuff like that. But uh, now it's like uh, the Ethereum Foundation uh, has dedicated at least $8 million to ETH 1.0 and 1x um, research development, et cetera. And that is being spun up. They did that back in May uh, to do it for the next year. And there are teams being spun up as we speak, coordinators being spun up as we speak. So there's um, a lot of good stuff happening. Some of it's happening in the background. A lot of it you're going to see in the forefront real soon. ETH one forever. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but is it really going to be forever? That's actually the next topic, ETH one to ETH, ETH two transition. <laughs> if you guys want, you can just get started on the next topic. Just yeah. one, last, one last bit about that. Um, I mean, oh, he's gone. But the guy was just standing there. Uh, had like some pretty interesting hey. comments. Oh, oh come back. Still there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it wasn't about you, but just like in general, I think like, that developers, if you have like these peculiar use cases, trying, I don't know, like on ETH Magicians or somewhere like that, to try and like explain, like answer those questions and like, oh, our DAP is like kind of weird because it uses logs in this way and, and we'd like the note to do that or not do that. Like if there were like ETH Magicians posts, you know, kind of either complaining or requesting features, I think that would be well, pretty useful. I mean, like it, w 1559, right, was like one I was very interested yep. in already, right? Yep. And it's, I imagine a lot of DAP developers yep. care a lot about that because gas is, yep. is uh, you know, lifeblood and having a, a forum to be able to talk about that because yep. don't really want to jump in on AIP unless I have something, yep. you know, yep. meaningful to say, technically. So I feel like, yeah, ETH Magicians is kind of that more general, less formal forum where you can just kind of write a post and people will see it.